This program was brought to you by Kola Institute of Venture at Tel Aviv University. So what we try to do is changing the way we look at uh, pipe networks life cycle management. Now, let's see if this works. But before that, I would like to put some, some words about how actually we see the utility grid and how we monitor it. Everybody knows electric grid, everybody knows there is a water grid. There's a big difference between those two. The electric grid is something you can see, you can feel, it's monitored, it's computerized, everybody knows exactly what's happening in every segment. The water grid, from the other hand, some areas there are good maps on the GIS systems, but it's always underground and it's not visible and nobody knows what's happening actually in the ground. There are some SCADA systems to operate it, but the pipes, the network, which is a huge investment, is something we put in the ground six feet under and think it's always going to stay six feet under. So, and this is not actually the truth, and today we are losing something like 8.6 trillion gallons of water are lost in the world. We were dealing all these lectures before how we actually able to treat water, to use, to reuse water, to make more water. Let's start saving the water we have. And this is where we are coming in. So what's our company? Um, what we're trying to do is inline water network monitoring, and we do it by acoustic signals. We're using acoustic methods which are known for years, but we're using the same physics in the way that we are able today to make a much better understanding what's the stage of our pipe network. So what we do is water network uh, is what we call buried no more, buried no longer. We are actually connecting the pipe to the net. It's another word to say what you call Internet of Things. The difference is we are talking about water pipe network which are buried six feet under or something like that. So today we, what we do is every day a water pipe is monitored. So every segment, our sensors, and I will explain in a second how they work, is monitoring. We see that every day. And we detect the leaks when they are very small. We don't want to wait to the situation when you have a burst and you need to send someone to fix it. We want to know about the leak as something that is small, and now we can actually manage it. These are our sensors. They could be in any color. There is a small box which is attached to the hydrant. There is no connection to the water. It just touches the, the, the steel, and that's the way the, the acoustic sensing is coming into, our, into, the, into the box. It's a simple, very cost-effective installation. You just attach the box, and this is it. It includes uh, a GSM and a GPS inside that, so everything is already organized and uh, operating. The way we actually treat it is uh, working with our customers as software as a service. You don't need to install anything. You don't need to actually do any uh, IT operations. It's on the web immediately after installed. So you get all those maps and you get all those indications just after the installation. Now, uh, today we already treat over 700 kilometers of uh, water network in Israel, and I will later on go into those projects. They are probably the biggest in the world at this point of time. And a bit, a bit of information about how we actually get to this stage. We uh, started in 2009 uh, as an incubator company, which means one or two persons working in Kinrot incubator on a grant from OCS, from the Chief of Science, and building, uh, let's say, the technology and the basics for all this. And at a certain point of time, people are talking about us as a, a Silicon Valley. There's also the valley of death in that point of time. If the company is not able to find out the first project, find out financing, it's the end of the game. And we were lucky enough at that point of time to actually find a, a customer that we were able actually to demo and to build our first products. Now today we are, uh, we are Hutchison Kinrot uh, uh, company, which is uh, part of the Kinrot incubator. And we are out of the incubator already and uh, fund, funded by Hutchison itself, Hutchison Wampoa uh, itself. Today we have uh, quite advanced technologies which we'll go later on, one patent granted and few in the process. Why we need that? 
What's the benefit of water pipe network monitoring? I just want to give you some numbers so you get the, the idea. Water saving, just saving one cubic meter of 1,000 cubic meter, it's about 300 to $1,000, depends where in the world you are. This is a hole of about one and a half millimeter. It's very tiny, it's a pinhole. You will not think about a pinhole, something you want to save or want to fix, but this is actually something consumes quite a lot of energy as well. Just to desalinate it, 1,000 cubic meters is 3.6 kilowatts per cube. Predictive maintenance. We all want to know upfront what we're going to do. We all want to know what is the reason that we are going to fix something. But we want to do it upfront. And when we don't know upfront, we're getting emergency teams. We're getting exposure for problems in the streets. We need special police forces to, to take care of things. And that's a very, very expensive trial. Customer service. In the past, customer service were not, was not the most important thing, but today, customers can complain. They don't expect to have water shut down for, you, for days. If after three hours, you don't have the water back, they're starting to call the mayor, etc. You want a better customer service. In some countries, there are also fines to the utilities if they don't meet the standards. So you want to, re to take that off and to be able to actually Tell the customers, you're going to shut down for this amount of time and fix the leak. Preventive and pre predictive maintenance is also the longevity system of the system. Today, in the world, we are in a situation that just in the States, in the United States, if they have a budget of $1 trillion to fix or to make the water network which are underground to be working practically, Nobody is actually able to put one trillion dollar on that. So the question is what and where to replace. Today, just replacing one mile is one million dollar. That's in the States. In Europe, it's about one million euro. So numbers are almost the same. The cost is terribly high. Every uh, municipality has a budget of a yearly budget of 10, 15, 20 million dollars for pipe replacement. This doesn't cover. And this is where you need to know what you actually want to replace and what you can actually postpone. So this is where we are coming in. And what we are building is actually a leak detection, which we call full continuous correlations. I'm not going to go into explaining the, uh, what's the difference between noise sensing and full correlation sensing. But later on, if people will ask, I will be able to have time, I will go into technical uh, details. So what you see here on the screen is actually a map with our sensors in, in a certain area in, in, a, in a city we are working with. Each of those sensors are correlating with their neighbors. Now, the big issue here is that if you want to do correlation, you need to make sure that all those sensors are taking the samples on the same millisecond. Now, I don't know who are you are familiar with GSM network and phones, etc. None of them is accurate. So actually, we actually invented the sensor, which in synchronizing the time all the time, and when the, the sample is taking, all the samples of our sensor, right, doesn't really matter where, will take the samples on the same millisecond. Then we are using the GSM network actually to transfer quite a lot of data, more than 150 kilobytes a night per sensor. So all, this, all the information is transferred and everything is analyzed on the net. So that allows, allows us actually to a higher detection range. Acoustic detection range in the market is around 100 meters to 300 meters, even less. I'm actually generous a bit. We are talking about 300 meters to 500 meters, which means about two sensors per kilometer, about three per mile. It's quite uh, a big achievement because we can reduce the amount of sensors and actually reduce the cost of the whole overall system. Now, you know, uh, once we, you, we find an, a, a leak, you also need to pinpoint where the leak is. So we developed, actually, uh, 
tool which is connected to a smartphone. I will be able to show it later. And this smartphone beca becomes actually a tool. You can go take records on the field, find exactly the pin and where to pinpoint, and actually find a place to dig. <coughs> and this whole thing is also connected to the same system which is on the web with the FIT system. So it's a combined fixed and mobile, and we reduced the most important thing. We reduced the need for someone with a lot of expertise to actually understand where the leaks are. Um, and the background is a very, very heavy statistic analysis of correlation, a cloud computing system, and easy sensor installation that makes it easy to, to users to work with. How it get, we get there as advanced algorithms, that's actually the basics. That's where we started. So it's a multi-sensor full correlation system, automatic adaptive filtering for signals. Noise is always there. And there will always will be noise. So even if you're taking the measurements once a night when it's quiet, you will always face noise. Now, the noise in this city and is different than the other city, so you cannot assume you have a library of noise and you fit Every, it, and you have a library that fits all. You need actually to adapt yourself in every location and things also will change in the same location. And uh, another thing is artifacts. You have a lot of artifacts in the system. Why? Because you have valves that are open not to the end or not close to the end, water meters which are making noise, and are any other devices making a lot of noise into the system. Now, Noise, in this case, can shut down your whole system because if it's too high and you cannot really actually take it off, you won't hear the leak. You will hear just the noise. And we have developed a system that actually allows us to identify when it's an artifact and send the teams to fix it. So we get to a situation that it's not just finding leaks, it's also finding broken parts of the system, things that are not working correct in the system. Um, operation and engineering center. Now, why is that important? It's not a help desk. A help desk is needed for any computerized system. The big issue with, the big point is with uh, noise detection in our life is you need experts. And the reason you need experts is because those experts have experience, they know how to listen, they are patient enough, they do the work very slowly, and they are able to actually identify if it's a leak, if it's just a noise, etc. Now, if you want to take this system and make it common, and today in the world there are hundreds of experts, and hundreds is not enough, and they are all of them in a retired position whatsoever, so we actually build the system in a way that any one of you, anyone in the world that is taking measurements and he, and he is not able to make the decision where to dig or, what to dig or how to dig there, he is able to actually contact the expert that is sitting in our office and see exactly what he is seeing and he is able to support it. So then it becomes a service and this is actually the principle of making and changing the whole concept from an equipment solution, a physical solution, to a service. So we always do first call our engineer support before you're going down and dig. Just digging in the wrong place is very expensive. So it's a web interface, embedded workflow into the form of detection, and it's a leak fixing verification. So you know exactly what's happened. A lot of contractors are going to a place, they fix the leak, it's supposed to be fixed the leak, and then they cover. Now, you don't know if it's fixed or not. You assume they did a good job. What happened with this system? Next night, we take measurements. If, this, if, it's, if, it's, if it's okay, it's okay. And if it's not okay, we immediately see that. And this happens. Now, uh, we're facing issues like irrigation. We are facing issues like factories which are changing the method of work. And suddenly, we have noises in the wrong time or predicted time you are able to control all your sensors from the office because all the sensors are sitting on a GSM network and you are able to actually tell them what's the next time they're going to make the measurement. Uh, our business model. And the business model is quite unique to this industry. 
CapEx, everybody knows. I mean, we need to install the sensors, and that's the cost of installing the sensors. But the way we operate, it do every, with a very big OPEX option, which means you don't pay for the software, you don't pay for the service, you pay on a monthly fee. So it's exactly the same model as you have with your mobile phone. The difference is, is you make it easy for the utility to go in, and you make it easy for the utility to keep the service going on. Once you have the service going on, you are actually have a good connection with the utility and you support them. So this is the big difference, and the difference in this area is actually changing the way the water utilities are used to work. They used to buy equipment, try it by themselves, and honestly saying, most of the noise detection equipment which is bought today ends up in the cupboard waiting for the next, let's say, champion to come and open it after the last one left. And this is actual life. Additional services, we do optimization of sensor installation localization. We built actually a software program that analyzes the, the, the water pipe network in an acoustic way. And that's the way we actually calculate exactly where the sensors should be. So to minimize the number of sensors you put in a certain area because you want to minimize the capex. The number that is the most important one, which is another thing we need to place into the market is, what is the best cost per kilometer or per mile to monitor your network? And this today is something that the industry is not yet ready for. And this is one of the things we are trying to change. Uh, two operations we have in Israel, actually four now, but. Uh, the slides were done uh, a few weeks ago. One is in Netanya, which was our first project. The city of Netanya has an NRW of less than 10%. In European point of view, that's beautiful. In Israeli point of view, that's about 2% too high. So, and today we are covering about 170 kilometers of water network in this city. This is a shore city, so it's on the sea, as you can see in the pictures. And uh, it's sand, so when there is ever a leak, you don't see it on the ground, it goes down. It can go down for years, it can go down for, for months, but you never know. Uh, we saved so far with leaks that we calculated there over 200, 280,000 cubic meters. Actually, the ROI for that product is done in Israel terms. The city of Jerusalem, and this is a very big project. The city of Jerusalem is depend, its NRW is between 10 to 15 percent. Some of the neighborhoods are 10 percent, some of them are 15 percent NRW. As I said, it's good, but it's not good enough. Uh, we are doing there a project of about 1,300 kilometers. We covered so far 500, and we are proceeding. So they will have around 2,700, maybe more, sensors. Uh, what you see here is a neighborhood called Ramot, which is a hillside. And it's a different issue and different problem there because we have upstream coming at night, filling in, filling in the, the water pools, and uh, the noise is totally different than the noise you have on the shore side. Still, the same system works. And just in this neighborhood, with, which is fairly small, it's 52 miles, 84 kilometers, we saved over 22,000 cubic meters in the last four months. So that's quite impressive in an area that they figure out there are no leaks. Or let's say the last survey, which was not said there are no leaks. And that's the big difference. Because when you are actually listening to the system every night, you are able to find things that you cannot find in a survey. Uh, system is, uh, needs to be collab collaboration with a lot of things that are in the market, like smart water systems, GIS systems, asset management systems, and SCADA systems. And the reason is very simple. You want, actually, that the people will start working with the information in a coherent way. You actually want that the engineer comes to an area, he will have all the information, including leaks which are potential in this area, even, even though that are not going to dig them immediately, 
but you want the information to be on the same platform. We are working now with the city of Jerusalem to make everything on the same GIS platform. Now, a few words uh, about how you take disruptive technology and implement, and, and implement it into the water business. And uh, it's, it's not enough to have the technology. The technology is, might, might be good, hopefully, but the problem that we faced is actually challenging because we are creating a disruption. We are creating a disruption by the fact that we are bringing the information in front of the managers. If we put the system on, in, in front of them, they cannot say, okay, we think we are in a good shape because you don't know if you are in good shape. You are in a shape. Who knows what it is? The figures of NRW uh, can be twinkled around, so they're not very accurate, and everybody's happy. Now, going into the system and is, okay, technology, you need experience, and best to have it actually with local. But the problem is not just the technology. To create, when you are creating a, a disruption, the timing is very important. And in the water business, I think regulation is the most important one. One of the things we are doing now is we're actually finding out exactly which utilities we want to go around the world, but the most important thing is are there enough regulations in this country, in that country we are going after? Because if there are no regulations, the water price, and that was said in uh, previous lectures, the water price is a political number which has no connection with the water price. So if there is no incentive which is based on regulation, then the water price will be zero, and, and nobody will care, actually, about it. Uh, so that's the timing after uh, coming after regulation is very important. I think we are lucky enough to be in a situation that the timing is okay in most of the Western world. It's not in every place. I mean, I think uh, in Italy, for example, the timing is not yet there, even though they are starting to change. Uh, in this country, I don't really know. I hope to learn later on this evening. And, uh, but in, this, in the United States, for example, the cost of water is ridiculously cheap, but there are regulations now to that you are supposed to move your NRW down. So it's a combination of both. Another thing is the conceived ROI. Water price, as I said, if you in Israel it's very easy because the water price is good enough to actually build a good ROI proposition because the water is expensive. But when you are paying, like, he, like in Europe, uh, France, UK, you pay about 10% of what you pay in Israel, then the, the ROI should come actually from the asset management and other places. So when you're talking about trying to take a new technology into the water business, it's very important to take all those measurements and find out. Thank you very much for, for that. This program was brought to you by Kola Institute of Venture at Tel Aviv University.